Hello, fictional. Welcome to the crossover what ifs. Today we are gonna see, what if Naruto got harem with Korra, Kuvira and Asami. Part 1. Huge shout out to Walded Matter for this story. If you end up liking this video, please consider subscribe, so without further ado, let's get into the video. Ahhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhh
A tanned hand reached down into his vision, prompting the boy to look up into Cora's sparkling eyes, as blue as his own, a joyful smile adorning her face. Looks like it's another loss for you, eh Naruto? Cora teased, grabbing onto the boy and hoisting him out of the rope's course, untangling him in the process. We both knew it was gonna end like this Cora. come on. I just can't do the things you can. Naruto's rebuttal prompted Cora to laugh slightly and slap his back a little rougher than she intended, nearly making the boy tumble forward. I was only using firebending Naruto, you can't use that excuse this time. Naruto stared at her with an annoyed glance, cracking his back with a wince of pain. Oh shut it Cora, you've always been better than me at anything bending related. I mean, remember you had to teach me waterbending until they passed you on it, before that elder Katara wasn't available to teach me, and it's not like they're gonna let anyone else in this damn place, if it doesn't help you with your uahohoave at artistiaini. Naruto's joke, not really joke, made Cora laugh out loud, latching onto the boy's shoulder with her arm to support herself as she bent forward. Naruto smiled, the pair having frequently made jokes such as this that downplayed the white lotus in any way possible, though Naruto's eyes trailed up at the sentry that frowned at him as Korra continued to laugh. The white lotus had never approved of Naruto's residency. Come on Korra, we've got to make it to that test, remember? Naruto chided, tugging the still laughing Korra along. Dinner that evening with Tenzin. Well, there's another solution to my airbending problem Korra trailed off with an absolutely giddy smile, her words dawning on Tenzin and the white lotus elder seated in front of her, as well as the blonde to her left. Tenzin had been explaining that his stay in the South Pole was going to be a short one, a mere formality to explain to Korra why her training would have to be postponed, the reason being issues in Republic City. To Naruto, it made sense, the man was one of the council members of the city and thus had to attend to his responsibilities, but on the other hand. Absolutely not. The White Lotus Elder slammed his hands on the table in clear anger at Korra's insinuated suggestion. Naruto's eyebrows leaped up, his eyes darting over to watch Korra's reaction. Naturally, she wasn't taking it well. But why? All I do is sit behind these walls and learn bending, that's it. Part of being the avatar is going out and exploring the world on a path to help people. This is the perfect opportunity to begin. Not only could I start my airbending training, something that is necessary to becoming a true avatar, but I could begin to help the people of Republic City. It's perfect. Cora's explanation, clearly, fell on deaf ears, as the elder's face only grew redder with each syllable. That's preposterous. Avatar Ong tasked us with your safety until you had mastered the elements. Even if he didn't, Republic City is a dangerous place. It is far too early for you to leave the compound, Avatar Cora. The elder replied with a vile mix of anger and reverent respect towards the avatar. Naruto decided he hated the way that mix seemed to encompass everything he knew and had experienced with the White Lotus. Another slam on the table brought Naruto forth from his thoughts, watching as Korra began to leave in a frustrated huff. Korra wait. Sit down. Naruto called out, grasping onto Korra's wrist, prompting the girl to turn around with an angry flush, only to be met with Naruto's reassuring and caring eyes, calming her down significantly, enough to sit back down at least, the feeling of Naruto's hand lingering on her wrist in her mind as she sat down. Looking into her lap in order to avoid the anger that was summoned by looking at that, fat ugly, respected elder of the White Lotus. With all due respect, gentlemen, Naruto's voice brought those at the table back to attention, the three of them turning to stare at the seemingly out-of-place blonde, while Avatar Ong's instructions to safeguard Korra were done with good intentions, they are wildly outdated as it stands today. His words baffled and even offended the two eldest men at the table, while Korra's eyes widened in amazement. You insolent brat. Avatar Ong and True let's consider where Ong's words may have come from. Naruto purposefully interrupted the elder, ignoring him in favor of staring at the man with the real power in the room, Tenzin. The world Ong remembers and saved was one of constant war, of hiding from Fire Nation soldiers, of poverty and despair. A world of death. A world that didn't want an avatar. The world that didn't greet him with the open arms that perhaps he rightfully should have received. However, the world today is largely changed, for the better if I might add. His words seemed to have struck a chord within Korra, as she seemed to hang on to each and every letter with eager anticipation and excitement, while Tenzin merely sat and listened with what he hoped was an open mind. The elder was just struggling in anger, his face red with frustration. The world is no longer in a state of war, nor is it the dangerous, uninviting battleground that Ong remembers from his learning days, the same days Korra is going through right now. However, let us consider another fact. Ong faced the world with one element and one element only, air bending. And yet, he prevailed. Not through restrictive measures of his safety, but rather the exact opposite. Hora, on the other hand, has three mastered elements at her hands. Not proficient, mastered. As it stands, I believe it is rather, Naruto looked down, seeming to consider his next words with serious thought. 
Asinine, to keep the Avatar locked away within the compound, especially given that the situation at Republic City does not have a concrete time of completion, nor does it grant Korra a task to do while she waits for its completion, which, ultimately, stems Korra's progress. I think we can all agree that it's better for the world to have a fully realized Avatar earlier rather than later, hmm? His piece finished, Naruto lowered his posture once more, staring at the table in wait of a response. Naturally, Korra was first. Ha! Ah, see. Naruto agrees with me. What's so bad about me going to Republic City? Korra demanded, a determined and once more emboldened face glaring at the two older men, clearly a result of Naruto's deliberate argument. Absolutely not. The White Lotus will not even consider it. It is foolish to go off of the words of some, some boy than the words of the previous Avatar. And you, Avatar Korra, are a fool to entrust so much to this jester. The elder, his ravaged anger overtaking his sense of duty, launched himself at the Avatar, leaning over the table and stuffing his finger angrily in her face. Korra was disgusted, not at his actions, but rather the way he treated her closest friend. Naruto has done more for me than any of you White Lotus ever have. Korra's words made Naruto look up, but the angry face of the elder once more pushed his head down into a submissive posture. The verbal and facial war between Korra and the elder began to escalate, until seemingly the quiet Tenzin grew too frustrated with the pair's feud. Enough. Elder, sit down. You too Korra. The old man's voice boomed with a subtle use of airbending that Naruto caught, his eyes flicking upwards to stare at the man. Both of you are disrespecting the severity of the situation, as well as the well-structured response by this young man. Spirits, you two acted like beasts. Elder, as a man of your age and discipline, this is hardly becoming behavior. And you, Korra, as the avatar you need to learn to properly deal with those that do not agree with your decisions or your actions. Now, ultimately the decision resides within my discretion, considering I am to be Korra's teacher. Tenzin's outburst had effectively calmed the two and even humbled the pair of excitable debaters. Now, young Naruto, I will propose a course of action that may placate both parties. Korra, the girl perked up, as did her blonde friend, you may accompany me to Republic City, seeing the girl's coming explosion of happiness, Tenzin quickly laid down the rules, on the condition that white lotus entries be placed around the air temple, as well as you respect the city's rules, my rules. And naturally, Tenzin gestured towards Naruto, prompting the room to stare at the boy, the wishes of this young man. Blood. No matter what he tried to wash it off with. Water, cold or hot. Soap, soft or harsh. Even bleach in one stupid attempt. It stayed there. A large splatter across his left cheek, trailing up to his left eye and drying over his lower eyelashes. One splatter trailed to his nose, drying into a dark red line across the bride of his nose and connecting to his right eyelash, where it dripped down into his right eye, blurring over his pupil and forever showing him what he would not forget. Lastly, the largest splatter trailed over his mouth, hardening into a dark paste over his lips and seeping into his mouth, cascading down his tongue and drying over his throat, casing it in blood that had mixed together to form his own life. Boring walls of snow and ice melted, the pools of water reflecting red until they jumped up and reached for the sky, turning gray and solid in the process, and becoming a jumbled confusing mess of skyscrapers and factories that both confused and reminisced. The calming waters gained energy, the wind encouraged by bustling crowds of people that waded through the water, adding their own filth to the waters as they cascaded over the city, becoming criminals and lowlifes. Few white lotus remained, though the ones that were forgotten were replaced with angry, metal-adorned police officers. Naturally, the body stayed, a tangible wide outline of their bodies being drawn in the middle of the street. Cars and people passed a team by, even as he began to regress, separated from the bodies by a threateningly corrupt pure white line. And thus, the now small boy's blonde hair was stained and became filthy in the smog and trash of Republic City. Bonga spirits Naruto mumbled breathlessly, rolling over in his bed and staring out of the window, surprised to no longer see the blue ocean, but rather the grey stone of a port. He still felt the numbing sensation of the boat rocking with the waves of the sea, as he had for the past week. At first the waves had been disorienting, sickening even, but as a waterbender Naruto's keen sense of water and its motions had quickly quelled whatever queasiness was there from a life behind solid walls on solid ground. Naruto 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 Naruto. Naturally, Korra gave the boy no time to properly wake up, her muffled shouts through the metal walls of the ship's hull, bringing a soft smile to the boy's still sleep-stiffened face. Groaning lightly, he swung his legs over his bed's edge in time for his door to burst open by an energetic hand, at times, immature bender. Hello, Koro. Naruto's greeting was cut short as the girl propelled herself at him, wrapping her arms around his torso as she toppled over him in her excitement, raising her head to flash the boy with a smile, perhaps as bright as the lights of Republic City. We're here. We're really here. Ah spirits it took so long I thought they were pulling a fast one and turning around to go back to the South Pole. But we're here, we're here. We're here. 
can you believe it Naruto? Korra shouted, bouncing up and down on his chest, the bed squeaking and groaning with her added weight, Naruto doing the same as her rather dense body, from a literal lifetime of training beat upon his body. Ah, Korra. Let me get up and then I'll tell you. Naruto groaned out irritated, heaving the girl off of his body and quickly rising to avoid another pounce. Rapidly, Naruto began to put on the traditional water tribe clothing, only to be stopped by an aggressive tug from Korra, nearly throwing his balance out completely. You're not wearing that whole jetup, are you? Her glance told him she thought he was being stupid. Well, yay. I mean, I've been wearing it for what, 11 years now? I don't see a reason to stop now. Her stare only became worse as he finished, her mouth dropping open and her eyes widening, before an excitement overcame her accusatory stare as she grabbed his arm. But don't you see we're past all of that now. This is the next step in our lives Naruto. You can't keep wearing that stuff anymore. Plus, it'll be why I eat a hot with that on in Republic City. HRMMM well, I guess you're right, for once. Naruto elbowed the girl and laughed, a teasing look on his face, as his sapphire eyes glowed with amusement at her pouting glare. But, what should I wear then? Well you don't have much to work with, do you? Just all this water tribe junk huh? Boy, don't talk about it like that. For one, this is your heritage might I remind you, and two, I'm proud to have been brought up in the southern water tribe. I would have been a criminal, if not dead, had your father not taken pity on me. I'm wearing this junk as you called it, whether you want me to or not. Finishing with a huff of irritation, Naruto began to pull on his water tribe gear with angry, aggravated movements, though Korra spoke up. Come on, you know I didn't mean it that way. Naruto didn't look at her. Come on. I'm sorry, okay. Is that what you wanted? Glancing at her, Naruto sighed and wrapped his arm around her shoulders. Fine. How about a compromise, I won't wear the jacket. Deal. Seeing the way she beamed up at him, Naruto smiled as well. Finally finished a minute later, Naruto stepped out of his room with a large pack on. His talk consisted of a tightly fit light blue shirt completed with a dark blue band on his left arm and two dark blue fit sleeves on his forearms. Adorning his waist were wolf furs, symbols of becoming a man in the eyes of the Southern Water Tribe, and as such, he would never take them off to remember perhaps one of the best nights of his life. Baggy, snow-ready dark blue pants, and his lower appearance finished with standard boots. Though, Korra noticed, he did have a circular pendant hanging from his neck, roughly half an inch in diameter, adorned with a swirling symbol. She had never noticed he worn it around his neck. Hey, what's this Naruto? Voicing her curiosity, Naruto stared at the pendant as she appraised it, the swirling symbol glinting in the light. For a brief moment, the whirl darkened and blood caked his eye, the symbol beaming into his only remaining eye, a smile holding it impossibly far away from him. In a panic, Naruto tore the pendant out of Korra's hand and clutched it to his chest, breathing slowly. Korra looked at him in shock. Sorry, just, this means a lot to me. It was my mother's. Naruto did not say more, brushing lightly past Korra and down the hull of the boat. Korra caught up, but figured that the pendant was a touchy subject and wisely chose to ignore it. Growing irritated by the silence though, as the overwhelming energy she exhibited, she quickly began to skip and grin. So, Naruto, remember anything about Republic City? Korra questioned, knowing that he had initially grown up in the city until her father had brought him to the Southern Water Tribe, though she knew nothing of his life before that point, except for that his parents had experienced an early death. In her excitement and her skipping, she did not notice the way Naruto's sapphires darkened into ice, a trail of icy breeze following his pouch he kept for waterbending purposes. Yeah actually. When we get a chance, there's a theater my family used to go to every week. I think I still remember where it was. As for other things, well the police are metalbenders almost exclusively. At least the special forces are exclusively metalbenders, if I remember correctly. Um, well, all of the buildings are these towering achievements of modern architecture. And well, there's a massive statue of you. Well, the Ongyu. Republic City's got a lot of places to visit and look at, so we'd best be sure to see all of them, so that you don't throw a fit. Hey. Korra roughly jabbed into Naruto's side, though the boy found it hard to care, the smile on his face dulling the pain in his ribs. The pair continued until the light from the outside world burned Naruto's pupils, the initial bright glare dulling until eventually he could make out the looming skyline of Republic City from the dock. Staring at the pair were a collection of very important people to the world, Naruto could tell simply by the way they held themselves, and well, he knew the majority of them. There was, of course, Tenzin, who had left with his family on his flying bison, preparing Republic City for Korra's arrival, while she and him had taken the trip by boat. Next to his shiny bald head stood a woman clad in equally shiny metal armor, Lin Bifong. Damn, that woman was still running the police force of Republic City. 
Next to her was a wild card, a man dressed in some sort of waterbender apparel, and flashing a massive and welcoming smile at specifically Cora, ignoring Naruto's presence, even at her immediate side. Finally, standing some distance away from the rest were a trio of people, all dressed in grass green apparel adorned with metal accessories, their apparent leader being a woman of similar looks to Lin Bifong, grey hair included. Tenzin went to step forward, only to be beaten to the punch by the man in water tribe apparel, who stepped forward with wide, welcoming arms. Ah greetings, Avatar Korra, the man dramatically bowed, causing Naruto to reel back slightly in shock, a confused look on his face, prompting a giggle from one of the people in green, my name is Terlock. I'm the chairman of the United Republic Council. Pleasure to make your acquaintance. I'm sure we'll be able to do great things for Republic City, together. Naruto instantly knew he hated that grin the man gave with a guttural, instinctual hatred. Korra, while clearly discomforted by the man, managed an awkward smile and a nod of acknowledgement. A clearly annoyed and irritated Tenzin stepped forward, making for a sight Naruto honestly thought he would never see. Yes well, it is good to see you Korra, and you too Naruto. These two lovely ladies behind me are Lin and Sion Bifong. Lin is the chief of the Republic City Police Force, and Sion is the acting leader of Zaofu, the city-state in the Earth Kingdom. Tenzin introduced the pair as they stepped forward, raising his hand towards the aged women. This here is Avatar Korra and her friend, Naruto. Why hello. It's so good to see you Korra. And I'm sure you'll make wonderful company, uh, Naruto was it. The Sion lady stated with an airy, happy mood, grasping Korra's hands gently and smiling at the pair. Over there's my stick in the mud sister, Lin, we don't agree on much other than not talking to each other. But well, you win some you lose some, and Lin wins a lot. Well, Sion leaned in, a teasing smile on her face, she likes to think so anyway. He. Korra genuinely laughed at the energetic woman, seeming to enjoy herself, while Naruto continued to stare at Lin rather intently, thinking about something. Lin stepped forward, ignoring both Naruto and Sion, and leaning into Korra's personal face. I came today simply to inform you that, despite your status as the Avatar and Avatar Ong's good relations with my mother, you will not be receiving any special treatment from the Republic City Police Force, especially from me. You take one step out of line and you will be punished accordingly. A connection to the spirits and glowing eyes will not save you from the law. Remember that. And you, young man, when I was told of your arrival I did some digging to make sure I knew who you were. After what I found, Naruto stepped back in fear when Lin reached out her hand, only to stare into her eyes when she rested her hand on his shoulder in a comforting manner, I'm sorry for what happened, and should you need anything, I will extend at least formal help that I feel is necessary. Beyond that, you're on your own. Patting his shoulder once more, the rough woman walked away, ignoring her sister completely. Naruto watched her go, his mind pulled back into his misery from her words, not even noticing that the eyes of everyone in the group were on him. Naruto did not acknowledge the eyes, but looked at Korra with a fiery intensity and put his hand on her shoulder. Hey Korra, I got some things I need to do. I'll uh, I'll see you tonight and we'll go tour the city like we said, okay? Without giving the girl a chance to reply, Naruto jogged off towards Chief Bifong, catching up quickly, leaving an intrigued and slightly worried group of people and a bewildered and slightly hurt Korra. Well, anyway, I think it's time that we introduced Republic City to the Avatar, huh? Terlock offered, trying to sway the group's attention from the rapidly disappearing figure that was Naruto, only to be met with some well-hidden irritation from Tenzin. That can wait for later Terlock. This is Korra's first day in Republic City, and there are much more important things to do. We've got to show her Air Temple Island and see if she's got any natural skill at airbending, and then we've got to get her settled in. Besides, it seems she's got plans with that young man, so whatever you've got planned for her can wait. End of story. Terlock seemed very annoyed, even angry, though he was ignored as the group began to walk forward, forming a protective semicircle at Korra's sides. Sion smiled and walked close to the girl, placing her hand on the girl's shoulder. Don't worry Korra, he's just dealing with my sister. He should be fine. She comforted, seeing the clear discomfort on Korra's face, the girl ignoring the rest of the group and staring at where Naruto's figure had disappeared. Yea but, we're always together. If he needs to deal with something, why couldn't I help? I mean, I'm the Avatar, I should definitely be able to handle whatever it is that he needs help with, right? Korra questioned, looking into the eyes of the Bifrong woman for guidance, to which she smiled. Perhaps it is because you are the Avatar that he did not ask you. You've got a lot on your plate as it is, simply by being the Avatar. Maybe he feels that his problems are beneath you, and because of that he doesn't want to bother you about them. But of course, maybe he just doesn't want to make you worry. Besides, you two have got that date later tonight him. Sion teased, smiling as the girl's face colored in embarrassment. Bait, no. No 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 we're just friends. Plus, I've never been to Republic City and he has, so, so he's gonna be my tour guide. Yeah, my tour guide. 
Kor rebutted, though Cyan merely laughed at the poor girl. I know a crush when I see one little girl, you can't fool these eyes. Cyan laughed as Cora grew increasingly frustrated at her coy attitude, though she grew slightly serious in an instant. Though, I hate to be a tough old woman, but as the avatar, your security must be ensured. I don't doubt that not only you and that boy are capable, but there is still concern. I'll have one of my people act as your security during the so-called tour, so don't be surprised when they show up okay. Ah, I can't do it. Cora's loud shouting echoed throughout the usually peaceful air temple island, the gleaming skyline of Republic City beaming over the temple, as Cora fell once more on her back, airbending attire dirtied and torn from many failures to even progress in the training she was receiving. Henzin walked over towards the frustrated avatar, reaching his hand out to help her, though the girl refused and angrily used a spiral of firebending from her hands to launch her upwards into a deflated stance. The key is to be Lee I know I know I know. Be like the leaf I've heard it at least 50 times now. I can't be a leaf. I can be fire, Korra's frame became wrapped in an angry orange plume of flame, I can be water, the flames around Korra vanished, as a wonderful spiral of water and ice formed a vertical ocean across her body, I can even be earth. The water seeped into Korra's bending pouch as stone curled up her legs and over her torso in the process, but I can't be a leaf. Korra finished with a violent expulsion, the three previously used elements exploding behind her, as she glared at the calm Tenzin. That is why I am teaching you Korra. To be like the leaf. This is only day one, you will learn it within time. Now, let's get back to the exercises. Ignoring Korra's groan, the airbending master proceeded to once more launch a literal wall of air at the many wooden boards, causing a symphony of moving pieces to become one, spiraling dance. From the air it almost looked like the gears of a watch, as even though the boards were close enough to touch in some areas, they never did, for the air carried them to safety. This was the lesson Tenzin was trying to teach to Korra with little success. Beginning once more with an irritated yet determined glare, Korra launched herself into the boards, only to once more get beaten by numerous pieces of inanimate unthinking, unfeeling, stupid pieces of wood. The anger and frustration continued to build exponentially as her torso was beaten back and forth roughly and harshly, and Korra began to feel flames spark in her chest and her teeth grit until her eyes opened and caught sight of perhaps her biggest source of happiness, regrettably, frustration in the past few hours she had spent in Republic City. Determined, Cora began to try and weave through the walls, managing to avoid a few hits, but still ultimately failing the exercise, though it was a marginal improvement as she had actually managed to flow for a brief moment like a leaf. Groaning, Cora sat up at the opposite side of the training spot, beaten and bruised, though through the walls she watched as golden rays of hair beamed back at her, as Naruto conversed with Tenzin. Smiling happily, Cora launched up and dusted herself off before rapidly jogging towards Naruto. Hey. Naruto. It took you forever to show up. Was that chief lady really so interesting? Naruto's brows rose before his smile rose to meet them as he waved back, high-fiving the girl as she approached. This confused Kor though. What was that for? Well, Tenzin just told me that was the best attempt you've made at these wall things so far. So, good job. His smile made Kor feel giddy as did his words, but she was still confused. But I failed the task. I'm just not cut out for airbending. She sighed depressedly, though Naruto frowned and smacked the back of her head lightly. Oh cut that crap out. Progress is progress. I mean, you're the avatar. You'll get it eventually, otherwise you can just cheap out and use the other three elements. I mean, you're a master at those so you'll do fine. His words really made Korra felt like she was capable of fighting the whole world and winning. She smiled despite her aching body, though her mouth dropped into a curious O as she stared at Naruto. Hey, what were you doing while you were gone anyway? Leaning in, Korra hoped Naruto would tell her, as it had really bothered her that he didn't earlier. Naruto seemed pensive and waved away Korra's question. Ag don't worry about it, just asking Chief Bifrong a question or two and then making my way here. Well we're out later I've got to go back to her and grab something she said she'd get for me though, but we can do that when we're on our way back here. Anyway, how's it been on Air Temple Island? Anything interesting? Korra didn't miss the way Naruto looked away from her when he passed off her question, though decided that it really must not be important if Naruto didn't want to tell her. Ah well, I saw Tenzin's kids again, you remember them right? Then I got dressed in this stuff while the White Lotus guys were putting my stuff away, and I think they put yours away, but well, you know the White Lotus. And then well, Tenzin started to teach me airbending, well not really teach since I can't get it at all. Ugh. Korra crossed her arms, reminding herself of her frustration. Tenzin, who was standing awkwardly behind Naruto the whole time, had the decency to rub the back of his head in exasperation, though Naruto merely chuckled. Seems like an interesting day you've had here. Cool. Well, I'm gonna go see if I can get my stuff set up here, but I'll be back soon, k? Okay? Korra nodded and Naruto waved before jogging away, nodding at Tenzin as he left towards the temple. 
Well now that your break is over, let's get back to your training. You did much better during your last attempt, I'm confident that you will be able to make some more progress. Once more. With his piece finished, Tenzin once more bent a wall of air towards the boards. And once more, sounds of flesh on wood echoed throughout the open space of the temple. Naruto trotted slowly towards the dormitories, hoping that the White Lotus guards were nice enough to at least put his stuff in the dorms. While he understood that their devotion was ultimately to Korra, or rather, her status, it seemed that when it came to anyone else, the group lacked basic human decency. At times, it seemed to Naruto like they were a glorified cult given actual responsibilities. Laughing at his own thoughts and shaking his head, Naruto entered the dormitory hall, to be met with the surprised face of a green and metal-clad woman. Naruto's eyes were immediately drawn to her face, naturally, though they trailed down to the small beauty mark under her eye, and then onto her rather soldier-like apparel. Uh uh, who are you? Naruto questioned defensively, though his aura was one of awkwardness as he didn't want to get caught staring. The woman merely smiled in a placating manner, putting her hands out to try and calm the boy down. Aha, relax, relax. My name is Kuvira, and I'm a soldier of Cyan Bifong. She sent me to the island to act as a personal guard to Avatar Korra. I was there when you two arrived at the port. Naruto, right. Kuvira's smile calmed Naruto immensely, and he found he enjoyed seeing it, smiling back at her. Yeah, damn, I think you're the first person since I got here to actually know my name, let alone remember it. Thanks for that. Naruto sighed exasperatedly, leaning on the wall next to the door he had entered, Kuvira standing in front of him with a hand on her hip. Ah, don't mention it, if you didn't make such a funny face when Counselor Terlock was talking to Korra, I probably wouldn't have remembered. Kuvira joked, chuckling as she looked at him for his reaction. Naruto just sighed with a smile on his face, dryly chuckling in a sarcastic manner. Breathe anyway, I've gotta see if those white lotus guys put my stuff here. You see a big pile of southern water tribe looking stuff. Kuvira chuckled, staring at Naruto for a brief moment after his question. No. Anything important in there I should know about. Her question seemed odd, but being a soldier Naruto figured she just wanted to know as much about her situation as possible. Not really. Just a few changes of clothes and some pictures of me and Korra, but I'm sure she's got those. Guess it's not so important, but even if it was, the White Lotus probably left it on that damn boat. Gah, those guys are lame. Naruto groaned, crossing his arms angrily and kicking some dust on the floor. Kuvira openly laughed, prompting Naruto to look at her in irritation. What? Ahahaha, it's just, Haya, the noble and respected White Lotus being called lame. Ha that cracks me up. Kuvira wiped a tear from her eye as she bent forward, hand at her stomach. Naruto raised a brow, but laughed anyway. Well I mean, they are lame. All they care about is Korra, and they don't really care about her per se, but rather, her title. The Great Avatar. If they really cared about Korra she would have been out of that damn compound since the day she knew she wanted to get out. She's been complaining and complaining and complaining about that place for years now. Naruto explained, looking off at nothing as he thought back on the pair's childhood. Kuvira seemed interested and motioned for Naruto to continue. Well, I guess they were nice enough to let me in the compound with her, well rather, Korra's father forced them to. We both kinda needed each other back then, these days it seems different. How so? Oh, ah, well, no, it's nothing never mind. Just me being stupid, that's all. Naruto shut up quickly, leaving the pair in an awkward silence, as Kuvira thought on what she had been told, while Naruto merely tried to get over something in his head. Well, seems like all you've done is talk about Korra, what about you? Kuvira's question seemed to surprise Naruto, and the genuine curiosity threw him for a loop. What about me? Ah well, I don't know I'm pretty boring. I mean, compared to Korra anyway. I guess the only interesting thing about me is that I've been Korra's friend since uh, I think since we were six and one half. That'd be eleven years now. Other than that um, well, I can waterbend I guess, but I'm not nearly as good at it as Korra is. I didn't really get much practice other than getting my ass handed to me by her every day. Kuvira nodded, trying to pick apart just who Naruto was, though he wasn't really giving her much to go off of. So you're a waterbender hmm? Care for a spar? Her offer caused Naruto's eyes to bolt open, a little spark igniting in there that Kuvira caught, making her smirk. Spar. Uh, well, no 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 no. It'd just be my loss, so there's no real reason to do it, right? Being a soldier null probably means that you're pretty good at bending, huh? Naruto asked, trying to get off the topic of a spar. Kuvira looked at him unamused at his blatant rejection of her spar offer, but did not let it put her down. Smiling, the proud woman nodded. Yes, a rather fine bender if I must say so. And, Kuvira looked into Naruto's eyes with an amused and teasing gleam, reminding Naruto far too much of Korra, a damn fine dancer too, if that suits you better than a spar. Naruto blushed and awkwardly covered up his face in embarrassment, prompting Kuvira to smirk in amusement. 
She found that the boy was incredibly fun to tease, as there was this innocent aura about him that just drew her to him. Iva, I've never danced. Naruto mumbled out, looking at anything that wasn't Kuvira at the moment. The girl laughed, grabbing onto his shoulder and pulling him out of the dorm. Hey, whoa, stop. I, I don't want to dance. I'm probably bad at it, I, I've never done it. Come on, stop. Naruto's weak struggles only spurred Kuvira on until she stopped at a flat area outside of the dorms, overlooking the sea. A defiantly rebellious murk took hold over her face as she looked at Naruto. Who said anything about dancing? We're sparring Naruto, unless, she smirked once more, the teasing gleam flashing over her emerald eyes, you'd prefer a dance. Naruto's face flared up again as he turned away from Kuvira, prompting the girl to laugh boisterously. Fine, we'll spar. Just, as long as we aren't dancing. Naruto turned around to see a fake crying Kuvira. Oh you don't want to dance with me? Kuvira pouted, prompting Naruto to wave his hands at her with a worried face. No 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 it's not that just ha 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 ha. Kuvira interrupted him by laughing boisterously, making Naruto realize that he'd be played again. Ah, you're just as bad as Korra is. Well what can I say, great minds think alike. Plus, you're just too damn easy to tease. Naruto. It's your own fault. Kuvira explained, casting her arms out to her sides in a manner off act motion. Naruto just sighed, bending his knees and loosely readying himself, though he furrowed his brow when he felt the weight difference without his heavy coat. Kuvira shifted into her stance as well, fists up and ready, though she noticed his brow. What's wrong? To hear a genuine question from the girl that had been teasing him relentlessly the past five minutes shook Naruto to the core, though he shook that off. Nothing just, this is the first time I'll be bending without my coat. Korra convinced me to not wear it in Republic City since, well, it'd be why too hot. Naruto explained, waving off her concerns and settling, popping open his pouch loudly as it swung at his backside, beating lightly onto his wolf furs as he swirled the water inside in preparation. Guvira, feeling the anticipation of a fight boil into a steaming eruption of excitement. Begin. Kuvira shouted, though neither fighter moved. Kuvira because she was naturally more of a reactive fighter, and Naruto because well, Kori usually ran at him with elements erratically flying around her. Kuvira narrowed her eyes at the way Naruto's body tensed and relaxed after she said begin, noting that it seemed to be a rehearsed action. He prepared himself for an early attack, but braced instead of got ready to react. Naruto felt his heart pound. Any moment she'd end it. He could see it. The metal on her outfit, as little of an amount it was as it seemed more for appearance rather than use, would fly into the air and sharpen, gleam. A floating knife. A smile. Naruto breathed in heavily, his body moving. He had no time to ponder on the extremely different reaction to that gleam, but his body moved erratically. Frantically. He felt his heart thunder away. He felt his veins physically bulge with how fast the blood was pumping, with the sheer pressure of it. Naruto stepped forward, sweat flying off of his body already, his eyes twitching in an instinctual fight or flight, and his arms heaved forward from his lower hip and forming an arch around his head. The water in his pouch did not move, but rather, the sea swelled upward with his motions and formed an imposing wave behind him that blotted out the sun. Kuvira stepped back and admired the wave with wide eyes before her eyes dropped to Naruto and her lids narrowed. The boy didn't even see her as it stood. He was seeing something else, staring into the air with fear dripping from his eyes. Kuvira took the advantage. She was a natural born winner after all. Stepping forward with quick and concise movements, Kuvira launched two metal plates at Naruto, each slamming into his wrists and forcing the wave backwards, slapping loudly onto the rest of the water and spewing up droplets like mist around Naruto, prompting the boy to groan and cough as his back roughly connected with the ground. Kuvira pressed the advantage, rushing the blonde with a gleam in her eyes. Naruto heard her footsteps, but it was drowned out by his thundering heart. He felt the mist, but it was dulled by the feeling of his own blood screaming from his jugular. He felt his entire body shake. He looked at his wrists, and where there was red marks from Kuvira's metal, he saw blood. It spewed. Naruto panicked, and his eyes finally caught sight of Kuvira as she rapidly appeared above him, two plates floating around her shoulders, having come from the metal flower-like piece on the center of her chest. Quickly, Naruto snapped his arm up, and the water from his pouch spewed forward, slamming into Kuvira as it quickly froze, forming a wall between her and Naruto. Naruto launched himself upwards, sliding backwards and hitting the railing that kept him from falling into the ocean. Kuvira shattered his ice wall with a spear made of earth, rushing towards him, as she knew in order to get him to react, she had to be the aggressor. She didn't know what was going on with him, but she was keen to try and get him to attack just once. Naruto watched as the defense he tried to build was rapidly and purposefully attacked and destroyed with an almost robotic accuracy. His breathing felt shallow, but with each breath he felt something. He didn't know what it was. He wanted to draw on it, felt a primal need to, but he couldn't. He didn't understand. 
This was just a spar. Just like the ones he does with Korra. But, why did it feel so different? He knew why. He didn't really know Kuvira. Maybe, maybe that was it. He could see it. From the moment she bent the metal all he had been seeing was his own death. Yes. That had to be it. He didn't know if she would kill him. He felt his body surge at that thought. His breath hitched. He grit his teeth. A tear escaped his left eye. And he smiled. He'd see them again. Naruto closed his eyes to accept this fate, but when he closed them, a smile met his mind. Burned itself into his eyes once more, until all he saw when he opened his eyes was that smile. Guvira watched as Naruto seemed to seize up in fear, and her eyes widened when a tear trailed down his cheek, until suddenly it flew towards her, freezing along the way into a thin, sharp icicle that sliced through her cheek and exploded into a furry of mist. She grit her teeth and hissed in pain, until she noticed that Naruto was once more not looking at her. She narrowed her eyes. Something was wrong with him. She knew that much at this point. Deciding she needed to end it before Naruto did, Kuvira no longer allowed herself to be distracted by his issues and launched the rest of her metal plates at him, linking them around each limb and forcing him into a restrained position. As she neared him to hear him concede, she noticed he was shaking. This time though, he was looking at her. Her. Naruto felt it again. That helpless feeling. That feeling of being able to do nothing. That feeling. She would turn around. He was waiting. He knew she would. She'd leave him. Alone. Again. She'd take Korra this time. Or Tenzin. Or. Something. Someone. But he wasn't a little boy this time. There was no Tonrak to bring him to the South Pole. There was no waterbending tricks to make money, not with the equalists about. Was this the end? The hand reached into his vision. He blinked. The metal on his joints left and floated up back into a floral piece on a green cloth chest. He looked up and found a soft smile. This one wasn't malicious. It wasn't fueled with pure psychotic desire to murder. It wasn't laughing at him. It was helping him. He tried to speak, but words left him. Come on, Kuvira smiled even though it crinkled up her scratch and forced some blood to leak down her cheek a little bit, you didn't do that bad. And, Naruto smiled. It really wasn't that bad, was it? You could be so much more. Don't you see? You are beyond this, even beyond the avatar. You could be better. Let me show you. Naruto shook slightly as he strode forward, hoping to whatever kindly spirit took pity on him that Kuvira would not notice. The spar had shown him something. Shown him a problem. To his side, striding forward away from the dorms to meet Korra once more in her airbending training, Kuvira shot a glance to Naruto and noticed that the boy was striding forward without attention, and her eyebrow twitched upward for a split second as she saw his eyes narrow. Naruto had an issue. That damn smile wouldn't leave him be. It would continue to torture him until he succumbed to its seduction and slid a boat made of sharp metal across the open expanse of his throat. He needed to deal with this before it became a problem. For Kuvira, if not Kara, since she would be acting as, well, not really his guard, but with how much time he generally spent with Kara, he'd be protected on the sidelines. Extra baggage for the soldier, if you will. Breathing in deeply, though quietly to not arouse worry in his companion, Naruto beamed at the sky to ease his chest. Chief Bifrong would give him the file when he met her later tonight. She had promised. That, he desperately told himself, was all he needed to begin a rapid solution of his problem. To the side, Kuvira noticed the way that Naruto's cheek-to-cheek -cheek grin tightened and his teeth grinded into each other slightly. She decided that whatever train of thought Naruto was on needed to be broken, for even the dumbest street rat thug in Republic City could blatantly see something was wrong with Naruto. The delusions he seemed to suffer from and the sheer panic and fear exhibited by the boy during their spar were warning signs. Kuvira, despite being a soldier and experiencing firsthand, at the very least, familial death due to murders and such, had never seen anything quite like the total and complete fear upon another's face as she had seen on Naruto's. And, Kuvira did not know quite why, but it bothered her, even if only a little. Hey Naruto, you got anything for me on Korra? Maybe help me figure out how easy it'll be to act as her guard. Kuvira's question was a double whammy and served to not only distract the golden blonde beside her, but also get some much-wanted information. But the way the boy seemed to hold the avatar on a grand edifice for worship and their long history with each other, he seemed to be the most knowledgeable on the actual girl herself, rather than what the endless rabble from elders past their day seemed to spew. Naruto turned to look at her, his hands resting on the back of his head as he strode forward. About Korra. Ah, that's easy. She's super headstrong and determined. If she sets her mind to something, she usually finishes it, and quickly too. A lot of things just come naturally to her, though she struggles with the spiritual side of being an avatar, and if you listen to Tenzin, that's why she's sucking at airbending. Well, I'm sure that's what Tenzin thinks anyway, since if I recall correctly airbending is the most spiritual form of bending as earthbending is the most physical, water the most flexible, and fire the most powerful. 
Naruto explained, staring into the gradually yellowing clouds of Republic City as the sun began to depart from the sea in the sky. Guvira nodded, staring at the clouds as well as the pair walked. I was unaware that she was struggling with airbending. Kuvira mentioned, prompting Naruto to look at her, now noticing the slice through her left cheek. Sighing, Naruto reached down onto his waist, stopping his stride to pop open his bending pouch and weave together a thin stream into the air. What are you doing? Kuvira questioned in a curious tone, through her eyes widened considerably when a cool, calming sensation flooded over her cheek, Naruto's kai flaring to life and seeping into her pores, a pleasant warming feeling spreading over her cut. Naruto looked to be focusing, as his tongue poked out of his lips and his brows furrowed together. When Kuvira realized what the boy was doing, she smiled softly and stared at the boy. There, sorry for doing that suddenly, but I just now noticed that cut you've got there. Naruto explained, bending the water back into his pouch and tightening the cap, letting the pouch hang over his wolf furs once more as he turned, hands finding their place behind his head once more. Kuvira smiled as his form began to stride forward once more, shaking her head and walking with him. Thank you, by the way. Naruto nodded, though he treated it as any old common courtesy, though Kuvira knew that not everyone would heal a practical stranger from a spar that they lost, anyway, were telling me about Korra's airbending. Ah, right. Yeah well, it's only been a few hours, but Korra was already able to partially bend water, fire, and earth by the time she was five, and she still hasn't made much progress with airbending, so this is by far her hardest element. It's weird to be honest, to see her fail. She's always been so gifted with everything she does, especially bending. She practically lives and breathes it. I'm sure her struggles with airbending have got her down in the dumps pretty deep. But, she'll forget that as soon as she's done with it, or she manages to airbend even a little. She doesn't really hang on to things for long. And, well, I'm sure she's just bubbling over with excitement to finally be out of that snow prison. Naruto explained, rounding the corner to see Korra flop roughly out of the wooden boards once more, huffing in frustration. Well, looks like you weren't lying. Before she sees us, between you and me, is she gonna be a problem for me, in the context of me being her guard? Kuvira questioned, staring intensely into Naruto's eyes. As pleasant as his talk was, her job took precedent. Naruto looked at her, and then back over to Korra, before sighing. Yay. She'll hate that someone feels you need to be there. And well, she is a very good bender, and she'd rather fight alongside you rather than hide behind you. I'd go as far as to say she'll make it a personal goal of hers to show you she doesn't need you as her guard. HRMMM Naruto put his thumb onto his chin and thought, before snapping his fingers and beaming a smile at Kuvira. I got it. Just tell her that you're just there to act as assistance, and I'm sure she'll feel a little better toward you. Naruto offered, causing Kuvira to nod seriously, only to be interrupted by a loud shout. Naruto. Korra's voice echoed out, prompting the pair to turn and watch, as the girl came barreling towards Naruto, and Kuvira side stepped out of the way, noting the way Naruto did as well, though he caught Korra and quickly transferred her momentum into a spin hug. Where was that footwork during their spar? Ooh what took you so long? Spirits, you were in the dorms forever. Korra exclaimed in an annoyed yet excited fashion that gave Naruto a fair bit of nostalgia. Tenzin stepped forward exasperated at how easily his student was distracted. Naruto went to speak, though Kuvira stepped forward and bowed slightly. My apologies, Ms. Korra. I forced Naruto into a spar that took up more of his time and resulted in his late arrival. Kuvira's near monotone apology made Naruto's eyes widen. This was a completely different person to the one he was just speaking to. Korra turned around and stepped away from Naruto towards the girl, staring into her eyes and narrowing her own. Hmm. Sparring with Naruto, huh? Naruto only spars with me Korra growled out lowly, glaring into Kuvira's eyes, though the soldier did not respond. Suddenly, Korra burst out laughing. You've got to tell me how it went. But, later though, because uh, who are you? Korra questioned, smiling exasperatedly and rubbing the back of her head in embarrassment, a gesture she picked up from Naruto. Kuvira grinned, noting that Naruto did the same thing in her head and casting a glance towards the blonde. My name is Kuvira, and I was sent here by Cyan Bifrong to be my guard yeah 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 I know. She told me about it earlier. Whatever. Korra's attitude dropped quickly, turning away from Kuvira with clear annoyance and looking at Naruto, who shrugged his shoulders at both girls, to Korra because he knew she didn't need nor want a guard. And to Kuvira because his idea was blatantly useless at this point. Anyway, when are we gonna go do that to her like you said Naruto? Naruto went to answer Korra's question, but was beaten to the punch by a stern glare from Tenzin. You may go on your tour of the city, but only after the sun has disappeared past the horizon. Until then, you will continue your airbending training. Tenzin ordered, prompting a loud groan from the young and learning avatar, the girl staring at Tenzin with an open mouth before mpfing and stomping towards the board's training area once more. Naruto sighed, smiling despite himself at the attitude of Korra. 
Kuvira noticed, stepping towards him and watching the girl walk away. You were right about her in every way. Headstrong, hates being treated like she needs protection and forever annoyed by her shortcomings. I was right to ask you about her. Kuvira commented, glancing over at Naruto from the corner of her eye with a small smirk. She was disappointed when Naruto just continued to stare at the form of the avatar as Tenzin once more prepared the training boards for use. Groaning, Naruto sat down, wrapping his arms around his knees, smiling as he watched Korra, though he suddenly turned to look at her and smiled softly, patting the ground next to him in an inviting manner, though Kuvira merely raised her brow at him. What? We've got nothing else to do right now, might as well sit and watch her right. Naruto offered, though Kuvira merely laughed softly and sat down next to him, staring forward with a content look on her face. The pair continued to watch Korra practice for a few minutes before Kuvira decided she could stand probing Naruto's mind some more. So, what was with you and Chief Bifong earlier? Kuvira asked quietly, though she knew Naruto heard it, if the slight dip of his smile was any indication. Oh nothing really, just asking her for help on something. I might have told you already, but during the tour later on I've got to visit her office and grab something she's preparing for me. Naruto explained, chuckling as Korra expelled her frustration in a loud grunt before launching herself once more at the boards. Kuvira nodded, outwardly not reacting to his statement. Must be something pretty hefty if the chief of the police force is personally helping you out with it, hm? Kuvira continued, neither of them looking at each other. Naruto nodded slightly, narrowing his eyes a little as he watched Korra. Yeah well, she's just being nice. The chief isn't exactly known for being nice, Naruto. Kuvira's counter caused Naruto to raise a brow, though he controlled his reaction. Ah well, just gotta know how to appeal to her I guess. Kuvira smiled, turning to look at the blonde, prompting him to look at her. Ah well, you're pretty good at appealing to people then. Kuvira stated, staring into his eyes with a confident smirk plastered on her face. Kora groaned as she slumped out of the boards once more, her entire body aching and in a large amount of pain, and as she forced herself to get up, she looked over at the two people sitting and watching her, or at least they would be watching her if they weren't locked in a staring contest. Kora raised her brow, before narrowing her eyes. Suddenly she felt very angry. Why was Naruto looking at that stupid guard instead of her? Wasn't she more interesting? Screw interesting, wasn't it always supposed to be her and Naruto versus the world? She thought it would always be like that, but there he was, ignoring her for some random person they'd never even met before today. Kora growled, a puff of smoke coming out of her nose, as her kai heated up and violently swirled inside her pathways. Kora stood up, anger flaring through her more than she'd like to admit, until she stopped as Naruto turned to her and waved with a big bright smile, his hair beaming gold in the sun, as he moved upwards to stretch his wave as high as possible. Kora's anger melted away, until her eyes met Kuvira's, the two staring at each other. Kuvira was smiling in a content manner, and Korra was narrowing her eyes with a bit of a pout from her lower lip. So, Naruto, since you're apparently going to be the tour guide tonight, what's the plan? Kuvira questioned, smirking as Korra huffed and began to do the exercise again. Naruto looked at her for a moment before looking back at Kuvira. Ah well, I've got at least two places in mind that we just have to see. First, we'll get some food at this wonderful restaurant and then we'll go on over and visit a theater I remember from my years here. Then I'll probably do a few rounds around the city, showing Cora anything that comes to mind. And when the night's done we'll swing by the police office to grab my stuff from Chief Bifong, and then we'll catch a ferry from the White Lotus back to Air Temple Island. Naruto's plan seemed good enough, earning a small nod from Kuvira, before she thought of something. When was the last time you were in Republic City? At this Naruto's face dimmed slightly, though he bounced back quickly. Back when I was six, so I hope my knowledge is still relevant. A lot can change in ten years. Naruto of all people would know how fast things can change, having had his entire life flipped upside down in a single minute that seemed to still stretch its course across ten years. It should be fine. This will be my first time properly seeing the sights of Republic City as well, yesterday was my first day here. Sain wanted to get here before the Avatar did so that she could properly prepare a welcoming party. You know, she's even planning a dance recital in Republic City. First time she's ever done a recital outside of Zaofu. Kuvira mentioned, looking slightly to her left to watch Naruto's reaction. His brows went up slightly, less than she thought they would, though he turned to look at her. Really? I didn't know she even did dance recitals. I don't even know who Sion is. Me and Korra have been cooped up in the South Pole forever it feels like now. Naruto explained, staring once more at Korra. Kuvira smiled though, relieved that it wasn't that he didn't care about the recital, but rather he didn't quite grasp its importance. Well, Sion is a Bifrong and is Chief Bifrong's half-sister, though they don't get along well at all. Sion is more of a free spirit and her ideals clash a lot with her sister. I don't think they've even spoken to each other in years at this point. 
Hopefully when Chief Bifrong sees this dance maybe she'll be impressed enough to speak to her sister, but I doubt it. I can see just how much their lack of a connection is hurting Cyan inside. She's a family person above all else, so not talking to her sister has got to be painful. Kuvira explained, prompting Naruto to nod slightly in understanding, though his eyes still tracked Korra's form through the boards. I'm in the dance too, by the way. I wasn't kidding about being a good dancer. Naruto turned to look at her with wide eyes, his mouth dropping into an O before it shot up into a smile. Really? That's cool. Where'd you learn to dance anyway? The intensity of Naruto's eyes and the excitement in them made Kuvira feel a small puff of heat in her chest. Ah well, Cyan took me in when I was eight, and from there she taught me everything I know. About metal bending, earth bending, dancing too. She really came through for me. She's practically my mother, and I consider her my mother. She knows that. Kuvira smiled when talking about the woman that raised her with all the love a real mother would give. Naruto smiled too, seeing how much the woman meant to Kuvira. Hehe, <laughs> it's kind of the same way with me. Korra's father took me to the South Pole when he was visiting Tenzin here in Republic City to try and talk about her airbending teaching. From there I've grown up in the care of Korra's family and the Southern Water Tribe. I even earned my wolf furs, which is a rite of passage into adulthood for a Southern Water Tribe male. Naruto smiled while he explained, his hand ghosting over his furs as he stared at them. Kuvira nodded, turning her eyes to watch as Korra flew out of the boards and slumped onto the ground in pain. Seems we've had similar childhoods, huh? Naruto mentioned, causing Kuvira to look at him with a raised brow, though she smiled when she realized he was right. I guess we have. Naruto smiled serenely, staring out at the rapidly approaching Republic City as it gleamed and shined in the night, water spraying from the boat they were riding hitting his face, though he didn't mind. His hands gripped onto the rails lightly, and he felt the way the wind drifted through his hair, carrying it behind him. Oh I'm so excited. Republic City. I've only heard stories about this place. And I couldn't even see it when we arrived earlier, but now I get to. Thank you so much Naruto. Korra beamed at him, grasping onto his arm and jumping up and down with excitement. Naruto smiled at her, waving off her gratitude and staring at the city, his chest suddenly clenching in on itself as a smile reflected off of all the windows he could see. The boat docked, and the trio stepped off, Naruto staying behind to pay the driver and thanking him, while Kuvira and Korra went ahead. Catching up with them, Naruto smiled at the sight he found. Korra's face was practically glowing in euphoria as she stared at the scene. Cars drove past, people walked in groups, lights shined all around. This was Republic City, the world hub of activity. The densest population, the wealthiest upper echelon, and the tensest politics. There wasn't anything to not love about Republic City, if you listened to the media anyway. Naruto knew better than anyone how bad the city could be, truly. It's amazing. Korra whispered as Naruto approached, her eyes gleaming. Naruto smiled, resting his hand on her shoulder. Welcome to Republic City. Naruto waved his arm out, gesturing across the expanse of industry and technology. Excitedly, Korra began to run forward, though a piece of metal flew out quickly and snatched her back to the group. What was that for? Korra demanded angrily, glaring at Kuvira as the girl bent the metal back onto her metal flower chest piece. You just tried to run into the road where Satomobiles are driving. You could have gotten hurt or caused an accident. Naruto explained for Kuvira, sighing as he rubbed his forehead. Korra had the decency to look embarrassed. Come on, I'll lead the way. Naruto said, striding towards the crosswalk. So, where to first Naruto? Korra questioned, walking beside him, secretly happy that their guard was behind the two of them. Naruto quickly jogged across the crosswalk, forcing the other two to follow, before slowing once more as the group crossed. Well, there's this one restaurant that I loved when I lived here. I want to go see if they're still in business. And so, the group began to walk through Republic City. Occasionally, they would stop and show Korra something, but otherwise their trip was rather smooth and easy, which both Naruto and Kuvira appreciated. Finally, Naruto stopped at a corner between two streets, his face contorting with confusion. But the Naruto muttered, staring at the sign that hung above the entrance to the restaurant. What is it Naruto? Korra questioned, looking at him with a slight amount of worry. Naruto looked at her and shook his head before looking at the sign again. Then, Naruto wiped his eyes and looked at the sign once again. Well, you him, a Ichiraku sushi last time I was here it was Ichiraku Raymond. Naruto explained, with a brief amount of dread that the two girls caught. Well, it's still Ichiraku food, I guess, right Naruto? Korra asked, looking at the sign and then back to Naruto. I guess we'll see. Let's go. And so, the group entered Ichiraku Sushi, and Naruto seemed to have a bit of trouble entering, still dreading what would be inside. There was a large marble counter complete with a glass half-wall, stools surrounding it. A few tables dotted the floor between the entrance and the counter, and only a few groups of people were seated in the restaurant. 
Naruto's eyes dragged across the store, finding it largely the same as he remembered, though now it had an aura of wealth to it. Like you would eat in this place if you had an above average paying job. It bothered him, because that went against everything that made up the Ichiraku that Naruto remembered. Naruto's mood brightened, however, when he spotted a familiar face at the counter. Gucci. Naruto shouted, practically sprinting across the restaurant towards the man. Said man looked up from what he was doing, and his eyes widened. Is that you, Naruto? The man's boy sounded out breathlessly, as if he had seen a ghost. Wait, did you say Naruto dad? Another voice echoed from the back, a brunette-haired girl appearing quickly from behind the door, her eyes widening when Naruto reached the counter. Oh my spirits it is. My boy. How have you been, where have you been? We haven't seen you in, what, ten years now? Tucci exclaimed, stepping out from behind the counter and embracing Naruto, the brunette doing the same as Kora and Kuvira approached. Uo Naruto, it's been so long. The girl exclaimed happily, holding his shoulders and looking into his eyes with a beaming smile. Who are these people, Naruto? Kora questioned, with wide eyes. It was very weird for her to see people so excited to see Naruto. He had practically only interacted with her and her family in the past ten years. The ho ho ho, these two are A.M. and Tuchi Ichiraku. I've known them since my parents moved to Republic City, and they used to serve me ramen. Tuchi. Why are you guys called Ichiraku Sushi now? Naruto demanded, staring at Tuchi with an urgency to his face. Tuchi replied with a sigh, closing his eyes and rubbing the bridge of his nose. About two years ago we fell into some hard times. A.M.'s mother died and I got sick. A.M. tried her hardest to run the store, but, well, she was only a 14-year-old girl. There's just only so much she can do. Eventually, a large corporate came to us with a deal. Die out slowly and painfully as Ichiraku Raymond, or get funding and support as Ichiraku Sushi. You can see what I chose to do. Gucci explained with a sad look on his face, and Naruto frowned too, his smile dying slowly as Tucci continued. Oh, well Naruto muttered, looking at the floor. The three girls looked between the two men, and Talayim clapped her hands. We still serve the Raymond Naruto. You remember the deal, don't you? Aim exclaimed in an excited mood, and Naruto nodded with fervor as Tucci brightened as well. Of course I do. Naruto nearly shouted, reaching quickly onto the pouch on his side and loudly popping the lid off. Quickly, the pair dashed behind the counter, Aim grabbing a massive pot and Naruto grabbing numerous spices from somewhere. Aim loudly set the pot down onto a burner, and Naruto smirked, going through practiced motions, water rapidly flowing from his pouch and floating above the pot. Tuchi, Kuvira, and Kora watched as the water formed a spiral symbol in the air, before Naruto dramatically snapped his hand down, the water spiraling and filling the pot. Aim came up behind him, clearly annoyed. Oh come on Naruto. You always do the spiral. What about the star, I like the star. Aim complained, staring at Naruto with irritation. Naruto turned around, a confused look on his face, irritation dripping from his sapphire eyes. Oh come on, I'm not gonna do your favorite for my first serving of Raymond in ten years. Come on Aim, get real. Naruto groaned, turning around and popping the cap off of numerous spice bottles, tossing the spices into the mix with a dramatic show. Tucci began to laugh heartily. Hehe, <laughs> that boy. Always a love of the dramatic. Quite a showman, that one. His words caused both Kuvira and Kora's brows to rise to the top of their heads. Naruto a showman. Done. Naruto exclaimed loudly, dipping his finger into the pot and louding moaning in joy. Just as good as I remember. He said loudly, grabbing a serving spoon and quickly making three bowls, one for each member of his group. Setting them onto his left arm, Naruto walked out from behind the counter and set them down in front of three stools, sitting in the middle and grasping a pair of chopsticks quickly, before beginning to tear away at the food. Kor and Kuvira looked at each other, shrugged, and sat down next to the blonde. Hesitantly, the two tentatively took their first bites, and immediately they became just as ravaged as Naruto was with how they were eating the food. Tucci and A.M. grinned as they watched the trio, happy to have turned two more onto their food. Kora finished, slamming her bowl down and sucking an air like a madman. Naruto that was, that was she struggled to find her words, interrupted as Kuvira set down her bowl lighter, in a controlled manner, before burping and causing a blush to appear. That was, that was Kuvira mumbled, until the two girls look at each other, and then to Naruto as he slammed his bowl down, grinning as a noodle stuck to his chin. Amazing. Naruto sighed happily as the trio left Ichiraku Sushi, full stomachs and happy mouths. Man Naruto, I didn't know you knew how to make food that good. Kora practically shouted, eyes closed as her mind hung on to the last remnants of that glorious taste. Naruto chuckled, rubbing the back of his head as he began to lead the group once more. Ah well, it's not my recipe. I learned it from old man Tucci when I lived here. 
they'd let me come in and eat for free, as long as I helped them make a batch of ramen, so I learned pretty quickly because I love those noodles Hey, <laughs> Naruto seemed to go into a trance as he thought more about the noodles. Guvira shook her head and grinned in exasperation, while Kor relapsed into a trance much like Naruto did. Shaking his head, Naruto laughed and continued to lead the group forward. Anyway, now we're going to go see if that theater I was telling you guys about is still there, hopefully it is. It's a pretty big building, and last I remember it might have even been the most popular entertainment in the city, but I could be wrong. If we're Lukoi. You there, you're benders aren't ya? Naruto was interrupted by an uptight man with mutton chops and a small hat on his head. Oh yay. Naruto answered, unsure of why the man was asking. The man fed and held his nose high, narrowing his eyes at the group. Naruto raised a brow before the man continued. I figured. It's practically spelled out for anyone by your outfits alone. Typical benders, trying to display your supposed superiority to any passerby. You disgust me. Get out of my face. The man demanded with a tone of superiority and egotism, despite the fact that he was accusing the group of those very same traits. This apparently pissed Kor off as she shoved herself past Naruto and glared at the man. Oh yay. What's so bad about benders huh? We aren't bothering anybody and, and you got in our way. Kor growled, pointing her finger in the man's face with a snarl on her face. This only made the man smile arrogantly. Look at you. Confronted with a helpless non-bender, and you immediately get in his face when he simply tells you about the wrongs you are committing. Typical. The man's words continued to piss Kor off, though Naruto stepped forward and placed a hand on Kor's shoulder before moving her behind him. Listen sir, we aren't disturbing anyone. We're just trying to get to the theater. Naruto explained in a placating manner, prompting the man to stick his nose up and HMPF again. The theater? Heh, figures you'd be heading there. Trying to catch the pro-bending game I suppose. All benders are the same, truly. The man mumbled, shoving past the group and walking away. Naruto's brows furrowed in confusion, but Kora began jumping up and down. You never told me the theater was a pro-bending arena. Kora shouted, smiling happily up at Naruto as her pigtails flew up and down with her jumping. Naruto frowned, looking at her. It's not. Or, it wasn't at least. Let's go check it out, I guess. Well, looks like he was right. It really is a pro-bending arena. Naruto muttered as the group walked towards the brilliantly shining arena, hundreds of people walking with them. Seems we got here at the right time, a game's about to start. Kuvira mentioned, having asked a passerby about the arena. Korra, hearing this, turned to look at Naruto with puppy eyes. Can we watch it Naruto? Please. Kora asked, and, well it hurt Naruto and it was very hard to do, he had to deny her. I'm sorry Kora, we can't. It's already getting pretty late, and I've still got to grab that stuff from Chief Beefrong I told you about. We'll see a game some other time, okay? Naruto told the girl, and while he got an irritated huff in reply, he knew she was okay with it as she started walking away from the arena, causing Naruto to sigh in exasperation. Kuvira chuckled and began to follow Kora. Line break. Well, we're here. Naruto muttered to himself, walking into the Republic City Polisifers' HQ, striding through the entryway towards a secretary near the entrance. Kor and Kuvira stayed back, looking around the building. Eventually, Lin stepped out of an office to the left, and she looked at Naruto with a soft look in her eyes, a folder in her hands. Kor and Kuvira watched as the pair talked to each other, Lin handing Naruto the folder allowing him to open it. The pair caught a glimpse of a photo of a red-haired woman and a blonde man in the folder, before Naruto shakily closed it and thanked Lin, and prepared to leave. Wait, young man, can I see that photo? Kuvira looked to her right as she heard a familiar face and saw Saiyan jog towards Naruto with considerable speed. Kuvira strode towards them, intent on at least greeting Saiyan, and Korra followed because she didn't have anything else to do. What did you say? Naruto asked, holding the folder close to his person. Saiyan looked at him a little more thoroughly than when she had first seen him and spotted the pendant in the middle of his chest. Her eyes widened slightly and she stepped forward and grasped it, inspecting it, though Naruto stepped back and looked at her with a weird expression. What do you want? Naruto demanded, a little anger finding its way to his voice. Sorry, but I recognize Kashina in that photo, and you've got a pendant. Say, you've even got Minato's hair. You're their kid aren't you? Saiyan exclaimed, confusing Kora and Kuvira, though making Naruto's eyes widen. You knew my parents? Naruto asked, stepping forward a little bit to look into Saiyan's eyes with hope. Yes, I did. They were great people, I'm sorry about what happened to them. Saiyan apologized, placing her hand on his shoulders, once more confusing the pair of girls, as this was the second Bifrong to do so. What happened to his parents? Naruto shook his head, gently removing her hand from his shoulder. Don't worry about it. But, how do you know them? Naruto asked, staring intensely at Saiyan, who smiled in response. 
The haha, well, I really only knew Kashina, though I had talked to Minato a little bit before they made the trip to Republic City. A lot of people don't know this, but I took an extended leave from Zeofu to travel the world and try to get inspiration for my dances. And your mother was a wonderful piece of inspiration. Oh the things she could do with water. Sion seemed to lose herself in her memories of Naruto's mother, staring off into space. But you tell me more about her bending. Naruto seemed desperate at this point, like a man without water. It made Kor uncomfortable, and Kuvira had to look away from him for a moment to compose herself. Sai looked back at the boy and could see the desperation in his eyes. Oh yes, but that'll have to wait for another time. Right now I've got to convince the police that I won't need protection during our dance recital. It would ruin the dance. We don't need any police there. Sai groaned, glaring at the cops in the room as she said the last part a little louder. Kuvira stepped forward, confused. Wait, why would it ruin the dance? Her question was good enough, though Sai looked at her like she was an idiot. What? Kuvira, come on. The dance is meant to celebrate peace. The coming of the Avatar, which is this lovely lady right here. Having police there would make it seem like we're not confident in that peace, not confident in Korra's ability to maintain that peace. It would be disrespectful. And, speaking of disrespectful, Sion turned to look at Korra, I trust you'll be at the dance, right Korra? We are doing it especially for you. Don't disappoint now dear. The edge to her voice honestly and truthfully scared Korra, who nodded rapidly, causing Sion to smile and turn around, her peace finished. Naruto meanwhile, was looking at the folder he had clutched in his hands, his eyes wide, with a sort of madness in them that his group missed. This would be all he needed, he continued to chant in his mind like a personal mantra. It was all he needed. Republic City took your parents Naruto. The only way to avenge them is to take Republic City. It is a city full of corruption, of greed, of crime, of despair. We can fix all of that, together. I'll help you, and you'll help me. We'll help each other. 4 in the morning. The quietest time that Republic City ever exhibits. Even the city needs sleep, even though it barely gets it, seeing as the sun was already beginning to peek over the horizon and gleam onto the reflective towering buildings. From his dorm on Air Temple Island, Naruto slowly breathed, trying to remain calm. His hands shook as they held the folder within his hands, a hefty thing it was, filled to the brim with reports and photos. Information. Sweat dribbled down the side of Naruto's temple, reaching his chin, where it held on for dear life before plunging onto his bed. Before he had only glimpsed at the contents of this folder and had saved it for this moment. When everyone else was sleeping. When the memories in this folder could be contained. When even the sun wouldn't see. Gulping, Naruto tentatively opened the folder. Greeting him was a photo of two people. One blonde with a sharp jawline, the other rose-haired with a soft disposition. The boy felt his chest clench, as it had in the office. This time, it was worse. His sapphire eyes first trailed across their mirror image, to the hanging blonde bangs that gleamed golden in the flash of the photo, down to the navy purple, fur-lined jacket and reaching the similar pants, finding brown boots connected to dazzling and sparkling white snow. Naruto flexed his jaw to stop his teeth from chattering, reaching forward slowly with an aura of reverence, before softly placing his hand across the image of his father. His index and middle finger ghosted across the canvas, perhaps leaving behind a trail of memoriam, of grief. Naruto choked back a sob, strangling it in the back of his throat with his tongue. The tear launched from his left eye like a cannon, shooting across the sea of his cheek and reaching the folder. The blonde man on the canvas smiled back at Naruto, even as the boy shook and pleaded with the spirits to teach him how to relieve himself of the flesh, even as the boy's immediate aura became icy, the air around him condensing into crystalline structures that floated all around his person. Eventually, Naruto finished grieving for his father, his shaky frame releasing its ghosted hold onto the man's image and moving to the woman that was hugging his side with an overbearing excitement in her expression. Naruto's lip quivered violently as his sapphire eyes trailed the heart shape of her face, reaching the violet eyes that stared eternally happy towards the beholder. As their eyes met, one pair unmoving as a historical artifact, the other shaking violently as an earthquake raked the boy's mind, his right hand seized upwards and grasped onto the whirlpool pendant draped across his chest. She was captured while wearing similar apparel to the man beside her, though her purple seemed more regal. Belonging to the upper echelon. A status symbol. And, her bulging stomach was another symbol of a status. Pregnancy. Naruto's eyes lowered, his form suddenly stopping its shaking as he stared at her stomach. That that pathetic wretched thing that would watch as these two, wonderful, oh so beautiful, oh so treasured, so valuable beings were slaughtered. Gutted. Ended. Naruto shook once more, the air around him further cooling, snow falling across his frame, though he did not take notice of the cold gathering at his exposed shoulders. Naruto reached his right hand out after prying it terribly away from the warmth that was the pendant and ghosted it quickly across the canvas of red, silky hair. 
Naruto did not feel the old, wrinkled paper beneath his hands. He felt that soft, velvety hair. As he breathed he smelt her, his mother. And he cried. Tears flowed freely from his eyes, his body shaking and twitching in pain, seeking to relieve itself. To get these feelings out. But Naruto restrained them, focused them. Sadness became anger. Anger became hatred. Hatred bled together with fear infused into a sickening toxic acid that burned throughout his veins, tore away at his muscles, and made the water within him fire. Naruto growled, even as his tears leaked into his open, grit mouth, even as his tongue tasted both blood and salt. He growled, until blood leaked from his mouth and dripped onto the face of his mother. Half an hour later, Naruto set aside the stained photo, propping it up on his bed to allow his parents to watch. To guide. They had always made him feel better. They had always helped him. And they would now. They would show him the way, show him how to feel better. Who who to hurt. To pry. To kill. To slaughter. To maim, dismember, massacre, liquefy, butcher. To gut. Naruto glared at the folder in his hands. His frame once more experienced a cataclysmic earthquake, though this one was not generated out of grief or sadness, but rather anger. And it was directed at one photo. One simple mugshot was all they had. The man had been arrested. Charged guilty for 17 murders. He had taken credit for them. And even during the trial, during the mugshot, officers noted that he wore a gut-wrenching, face-splitting, eerie smile upon his visage. Naruto's frame exploded into a shaking, twitching mess. His face was unrecognizable as his eyelids spazzed, his lips quaked, his nostrils flared, his teeth grit, his cheeks snarled. His heart thundered. But, it was at this moment that Naruto experienced a revelation. His heart did not thunder out of fear. It thundered out of anger. Tenzin awoke in a cold sweat, his breathing heavy and burdened. He looked around his room frantically, sighing in relief when he found a peacefully sleeping Pima at his side. For a few minutes, Tenzin tried in vain to relieve himself of this foreboding feeling. It was as if the spirits themselves were pressing against his chest, willing him to move. To act. But, he could not for the life of him figure out what they were wishing him to do. Unable to sleep, Tenzin resigned himself to his fate and got out of bed, careful to not rouse Pima from her sleep, knowing the pregnant woman needed it more than he did. Sighing in unease, Tenzin strode out of his room, using a crafty exercise of airbending to remove his sleeping attire, and ghost his regular attire into his hand from across the room. After putting it on and readying himself for the day, Tenzin strode about the dimly lit air temple island, seeking out each area of the island and inspecting it, searching for a sign from the spirits. For guidance. Tenzin found none. Desperately, he sought the dormitories with a keen sense of anxiety. If it was an issue with Cora Tenzin's pace increased substantially. But alas, even the female dorms proved to have everything in order. Confused, Tenzin paced quickly round the entrance to the female dorms, until a sudden thought revealed itself to Tenzin, and he nearly slapped himself on the forehead. That boy, Naruto. He had seemed troubled since Tenzin had met him, and, it was painfully obvious as to what troubled the boy. His parents. Tenzin had seen the bodies, he had been informed of what occurred. And he had seen those eyes. Tenzin shuddered as he neared the boy's dorm, currently housing only one person. Those eyes should not have belonged to a five-year-old child. Those eyes should not have belonged to any human being, whether cruel and vicious or heroic in kind. Tenzin beat himself up over that detail. How had he not extended his hand of support towards the boy? He was an airbender. That was what they did. Tenzin was furious with himself, though his thoughts were quickly swept away as a cold breeze swept through the boy's dormitory as he entered it, causing him to shiver slightly. Was the dorm always this cold? Striding forward, Tenzin looked at each room, unsure of which the boy had taken up residence in. Until, Tenzin found it. And his brow rose considerably, because, snow had slightly accumulated outside of the door, as if it were pouring out of the small gaps between the door and the frame. Fervently, Tenzin fell to his knees and tentatively placed his index and middle fingers into the small pile, and his eyes widened slightly. The snow was unbelievably fine. He could feel the soft crystals of each individual flake. They did not clump together, as snow usually did, but instead they maintained an individuality, a fate separate from the mass. And Tenzin once more was angry with himself, because he knew this snow. He had seen it before. And it made sense, causing Tenzin more grief over his own ignorance. Of course the boy would be capable of the silky snow. Quickly, Tenzin opened the room and breathed a sigh of relief. The boy was asleep, peacefully in his bed. A strand of the boy's hair draped up and down in the wind from his breathing, and his body slowly mirrored the action. A sudden gust of warm, or rather, room temperature air hit Tenzin, and he smiled despite himself. Perhaps that foreboding feeling was merely akin to waking up on the wrong side of the bed. As Tenzin walked away, relieved and calmed, he seemed to forget that thin, fine, silky snow that crunched quietly under the door as he closed it. 
and, as Tenzin closed the main entry to the dorms, he missed the way a cold breeze swept across his frame, carrying with it the scent of velvet red hair and strands of gold, mixed with an unholy toxin and grief. Hora groaned loudly, her face squinched and crinkled as she stretched in the warm morning sun that beamed upon her frame, adorning, once more, the traditional clothing of airbending students. She smiled contentedly when her morning stretching finished and turned around to spot a rapidly approaching Kuvira, though this time the girl was adorning a more soldier-like outfit, complete with the segmented metal pauldrons and collar that a soldier would be expected to wear, as well as the tighter-fitting and more professional-looking cloth underneath. Morning Cora, did you sleep well? Kuvira greeted, hoping to try and ease some of the tension between them. Cora looked at her strangely, before shrugging and turning to fully look at her. I slept well enough, what about you? Cora's question was a welcome surprise to Kuvira, who was happy that the girl seemed to just accept Kuvira's presence, at least for the moment. Yes, I did. It was a little strange, sleeping in the monk dormitories, but they aren't too terribly different from the typical barracks of Zeofu. Kuvira offered, trying to engage in casual conversation while the pair waited for Tenzin's arrival. Hora nodded, understanding her words, though she looked past Kuvira, trying to spot either Tenzin or Naruto, though she frowned slightly when she didn't see either of them. Ah oh man, how long is it going to take those two? Cora groaned in annoyance, slumping onto a railing and staring in irritation at the shoes adorning her feet. Kuvira chuckled and joined Cora on the railing, though she chose to look at the sky instead of the ground, having focused on Earth all of her life. So, Cora, what's it like to be the Avatar? Kuvira couldn't stop herself, her curiosity was seething when she woke up. She wanted to know what Cora felt about her status and to see if the girl was really as sheltered from life as she seemed. Cora grinned happily and stared at Kuvira with a deep ego that, while not harmful to anyone at the moment, was prominently there. It's great. Being able to bend all of the elements is amazing. But, well, I just love bending so I might be a little biased he, Cora's face flushed slightly as she scratched at her cheek, but if I were to be honest, the worst thing about being the avatar is how everyone treats me like I'm a child they need to protect. It's so annoying. I can handle myself just fine. Hora defiantly shouted out, striking a pose and pointing angrily at the sky as she finished, though Kuvira began to laugh lightly. What are you laughing at? Cora demanded, forcing her finger into Kuvira's face, who only smirked. Your shoes untied, but it seems you can handle that yourself, right? Kuvira joked and chuckled once more as Cora fumed and hastily tied her shoe, before bouncing up again and glaring comically at the soldier. My point still stands. I can handle whatever anyone throws at me. Cora exclaimed passionately, and Kuvira couldn't stop her brow from rising, a curious look overcoming her amused smirk. Oh really? All right, I'll throw a few hypotheticals at you, okay? Kuvira offered, not giving Cora time to answer as she looked at the sky. So, first one's the easiest example I've got right now. What are you planning on doing about the equalists? Her question threw Cora for a loop, who stared at her with a quizzical expression. The equalists? What do you mean? What are the equalists? Cora asked, looking to Kuvira for an answer, who merely looked at her and frowned, frustrated that Cora really was sheltered from the world. To not know what the Equalists are damn. You really don't know do you? Geez. Well, the Equalists are a group of non-benders that are banding together to protest the supposed assumed upper status of benders and are trying their hardest to knock benders across the world down a peg. How they're planning on doing that I have no clue. That man we met last night, you know the one that tried to say we were striding around town looking for non-benders to push around perfect example. He had it written all over him. Kuvira explained and peeked away from the clouds to watch as Cora seemed utterly confused, as if she couldn't comprehend something. And she couldn't. But, but how can people not like bending? It's so awesome. And, and cool. The world benefits so much from bending. I mean, look at Republic City, isn't the majority of the electricity used to run the city generated from lightning benders? Cora questioned, receiving a confirmation nod from Kuvira, look side. I'm sure it is specifically those benefits that are upsetting the group. They are merely a group of people searching for their place in the world, and if they aren't benders, where are they to go? But, well, the real issue of the Equalists is their leader, Amon, if what I hear is correct. He's a damn brilliant public speaker. I listened to a tape of one of his speeches when it managed to make its way all the way to Zeofu, and, damn, I was nearly turned over to an Equalist myself. Combine a man like that with a group of lost souls looking for guidance, and you've got yourself a mixture just waiting to bubble over into conflict. Kuvira explained, staring at Cora, trying to judge the girl's reaction. So, Avatar Cora, how do you plan to deal with the Equalists? You can't force them to like benders, and using force against them will only increase the tensions and potentially cause a civil war right here in Republic City. And I'm sure you can't exactly convince them, as the last person they will listen to is you. So, are you prepared to deal with the Equalists? 
Buvira's question lingered in the air, and Cora seemed genuinely stumped, and her aura seemed as if she had a grand revelation, though the moment was spoiled by Tenzin's entrance into the scene. Morning Cora, Kuvira. Tenzin nodded respectfully, receiving a nod from Kuvira and a distracted wave from Cora, who was still trying to ponder Kuvira's question. Well, let's get started Cora. Today we'll be where's Naruto. Kuvira interrupted, looking around the training area for the blonde, but not seeing his form. Cora shot up at the mention of the boy and looked around as well, frowning when she didn't see him. Yeah where is he? He's usually up and at M before me, and if he isn't I usually wake him well, I didn't wake him this morning, so maybe he's still sleeping. Cora offered, though her eyes lit up as she saw an approaching frame, golden-hued hair beaming in the sun and greeting, the boy entering the area slowly, as if he was walking through sludge. Morning, all, hey guys. Naruto mumbled as he approached, lazily waving at the group before dragging his hands across his face, shaking it slowly, as if he was still trying to wake up. Kuvira smiled and waved, as did Korra, while Tenzin bowed slightly in greeting. Alright well, let's get started. And so, a cycle started. A routine, if you will. Each and every day, Korra would try to train her airbending, Kuvira would guard the group, though she would leave usually halfway through the day to go and practice for the upcoming dance recital, and Naruto would sit quietly, either leaning up against a railing, sitting on a bench, or crossing his legs on the ground. And each and every day, Naruto would show up late, walking through the same mental sludge. But, Korra and Kuvira began to notice light changes. A darkening around the boy's eyes, a dulling of the sapphire in his eyes, and even a dimming of the golden hue that was his hair. It seemed to them that the boy wasn't getting enough sleep, if he was at all. And that worried them, deep down. So this part ends here. Alright that's it for today's video guys, let me know in the comments section how was the story, and also don't forget to like, share and subscribe. I will meet you in another video, bye bye.